This is just what? We don't have the copyright to so much. I need the music. Well, I didn't know if this was copy for you. Thank you so This little mm -hmm. microphone, <laughs> and then you change it there. So you. And then you can see what else is right there. See that? It's the one on the right. Without a reference. Well, yeah. Okay. 
All right, we're going to get started in like 5, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, as soon as the, the rate of people trickling in slows down to a rate I'm comfortable with. Uh, we're also live streaming, so this is a giant microphone and camera facing this way. Uh, so just be aware of that. Enjoy. You have 5, 10 minutes to figure your stuff out. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
All right, we're going to start the meetup now. Hopefully everyone's had pizza and beer and is full of hackery goodness. So uh, for everyone here for the first time, this is the Crypto Builders Meetup, where we basically, uh, it's an open platform um, where anyone can talk about anything from the research that they're doing, um, as long as it's cryptocurrency related in some way, or even cri cryptography. Uh, you know, you're welcome to come out and chat about it and, uh, you know, just build more awareness in the community. Um, this is NoiseBridge, we're, we're here at NoiseBridge uh, Hackerspace, which is a uh, nonprofit 
volunteer-run hackerspace, which means that no one really runs it, and if you work out of here or play out of here, then you're kind of you're as much of uh, as much as in charge as anyone else, which means no one's really in charge. Um, it is a safe space. We have a safe space policy, and uh, donations are appreciated. So we have one rule here, which is be excellent to each other. Uh, as long as you follow that rule, you are more than welcome to hack on. So tonight we have a very special guest, uh, Ty Walker with How to Mine Cryptocurrency. If you want to give a big round of applause. <laughs> All right, we'll let you take it away. Awesome. Let's do this thing. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so hi, my name's Ty. I um, have been mining cryptocurrency since the beginning of cryptocurrency. Uh, I'm not rich, unfortunately, due to some mistakes that I'll discuss in this wonderful presentation that I've created. Um, and so let's get the Bitcoin wizard going. There he is. And magic internet money, here we go. All right, so in addition to the rules of noise bridge, which there aren't very many rules other than be excellent to each other, I have a couple of rules or disclaimers. Uh, so I am not a financial advisor. I cannot provide financial advice to anyone. Um, so, you know, everything that's in this presentation, names of companies, names of currencies uh, that I may mine or, um, or use as examples are examples. So, um, you know, don't think that, you know, just because I mine Z Classic, Classic means that Z Classic is all you should buy right now because that would make no sense and you shouldn't do that. Uh, the opinions are my own. Um, a couple of other things, don't get yourself hacked. Talk about that. Limit counterparty risk, so limit the amount of uh, money you keep um, on exchanges and things of that nature. Uh, secure your private keys, uh, ledger, treasure, usual bitbox, I'll talk about that. And yeah. And trust no one. So seriously, in this space, just keep control of what you've got. You know, don't trust anybody. Just because I'm up here and Dan thinks that I'm Pretty good at mining doesn't mean that I know everything about mining. So you know, um, and just before I get started, um, a show of hands for people. Um, how many people have mined cryptocurrency before? Okay, cool. How many people have purchased cryptocurrency on an exchange or via cash through local bitcoins or? Yeah. Okay, cool. Sounds good. Wait, how many people own more than a hundred bitcoin? <laughs> how many people lost more than like, two hundred? <laughs> we'll do that in a moment. Okay, so a brief history of mining. So cryptocurrency mining typically uh, is based on proof of work. Uh, what proof of work essentially is, and I'll get into the details of this later, proof of work is essentially an expensive computing task. And what I mean by expensive is, is it, it's, it's uh, compu computationally intensive to perform. Uh, and so that's essentially how Bitcoin mining works, is that a bunch of computers all around the world try to perform a very complicated task of guessing, essentially, what the uh, encrypted hash of a given Bitcoin block is. And if they do guess it correctly, then they are rewarded that block. But perhaps more importantly is uh, that um, proof of work is cheap to uh, verify. And so it's the work associated with finding the Bitcoin block is expensive, but the, the network's ability to verify that this person did indeed find this block is cheap. And so Bitcoin mining started when Bitcoin started. Um, so Satoshi himself mined the first block of Bitcoin, which was at that time one block was 50 Bitcoin. Now it's 12.5 Bitcoin per block. Uh, the algorithm used is SHA-256, which is a common 256 bit encryption algorithm. Uh, the, January, uh, the Genesis block being a January 3rd, 2009. And so the workflow, or not the workflow, but the timeline kind of like went like this. So when Bitcoin was created, it was mineable with uh, CPUs, so uh, central processing units, um, and then it progressed into GPUs, graphical processing units, and then to ASICs, which means it stands for Application Specific Integrated Hardware, or Integrated Circuit. And so back in the day, uh, in 2009, 2010, 2011, any person that knew about Bitcoin that had a computer, pretty much of any sort, could mine Bitcoin. And if you consider today's value, they could have mined themselves a substantial amount of Bitcoin. Um, just as sort of an aside, Litecoin uh, began in October 7th of 2011. I don't think that it was CPU mined initially. I think that it was past the point at which CPU mining was profitable. Uh, so it was pretty much, I think, went right into GPUs and then into to ASICs as well. 
And so you might wonder, like, why are coins mined with different hardware? And the reason, uh, basically, is, is that um, as soon as people determined that Bitcoin mining was lucrative, they realized that, well, this hashing function, the, the SHA-256 encryption algorithm, you know, we could build custom hardware to do this. It doesn't require like all the resources that a typical computer requires. So like if you have like a desktop computer at home, you know, you've got a motherboard processor, memory, power supply, all those things. It's designed to run an op operating system. It's designed to play games. It's designed to do a lot of different things. Um, and when you have a thing that's designed to do a lot of things, typically it's not optimized to do one specific thing. And so some people figured out how to build a device that would be very, very, very good and fast at finding Bitcoin. Um, and, and Litecoin as well. Litecoin uses a different algorithm. Um, and so that kind of hit a point where GPU mining was no longer profitable. Uh, and so we'll talk about that in a bit. But basically the difference between today and 2011 is, is that you know, in 2011, pretty much it was Bitcoin and Litecoin. And now we have some 800 plus mineable currencies. Um, I've guessed at this number, so like, I know for sure that there are at least 1,342 different cryptocurrencies that exist as of November, so, or sorry, October, so I'm gonna guess that you know, about a little over half of them are mineable. The point is, it's a lot. Uh, and finally, you know, the main difference is, uh, is that today, mining is largely centralized, and this is a thing that people don't realize about Bitcoin is that um, it was intended to be a decentralized currency, right? So like you, anyone in the world can mine it, therefore anyone in the world can verify transactions. And what we actually have is, is data centers essentially designed to mine Bitcoin. So they exist largely in China, like Inner Mongolia is a, is a big place. Um, there's a data center buried in Iceland that uses geothermal power that uh, mines Bitcoin. And so essentially Bitcoin mining, if you are mining Bitcoin itself, is generally out of the reach of your average consumer uh, or you know enthusiast like myself. And so now, what do I do? I mine altcoins and uh, sometimes hold them, sometimes get paid in Bitcoin, and I'll talk about that. So, so I wanted to cover a few mistakes. So I don't know if you guys watch the show Westworld or have heard of the show Westworld, but there's this quote in Westworld that I really like, which is, "Mistakes is a word that you're too too embarrassed to use. You ought not to. You ought not to be." You're a product of a trillion of them. Everyone, evolution forced the entirety of sentient life on this planet using only one tool, the mistake. So as a miner, uh, and if you guys turn out to be miners, I've made a lot of mistakes. And I have deprived myself via those mistakes of a considerable amount of wealth. And so it's kind of like starting anything else. You want to do a startup, you want to learn to code, you want to learn data science. You're going to make a lot of errors, right? You're not going to do everything right. And so I want to go over my biggest mistake and then two other mistakes that uh, you know I think will kind of illustrate what can happen when you go kind of delve into this world. So if you know me, you know this story. And if you don't know me, then you're about to find out. So I mined Bitcoin uh, from 2010 to 2011. Uh, I mined Bitcoin because I heard about it and thought it was a cool idea, the ability to send money anywhere in the world. Uh, nearly, you know, at that time, you know, basically every 10 minutes, like there was enough computers to process the transactions, there weren't that many transactions, and so Bitcoin traveled pretty fast. Whereas nowadays, like I just sit in Bitcoin somewhere today, and it's like I hope that it's there when I get home so I can do some stuff, right? So basically, my workflow was like this I would wake up in the morning, I would check how my miner was doing, I would go to work, I'd come home, I turn my miner off, I play World of Warcraft until midnight or one o'clock in the morning, I turn my miner back on, and I go to bed. I do this every day for kind of a long period of time. I managed to net about 200 Bitcoin. So Bitcoin was worth about half, uh, was it worth about 50 cents at the time. Uh, and if you are a gamer, know any gamers, or you're a person that's had the unfortunate um, life of having to run Windows, uh, you know, especially back in the day, that sometimes Windows would just take a giant shit and would not work anymore, and you had to format your machine, right? So I had to, you know, format my machine because it wasn't running World Warcraft anymore. And, um, you know, I'm pretty sure I didn't back up my wallet.bat file. If I did, it doesn't matter. Um, but basically, um, I formatted my machine, backed up my movies, backed up my music, you know, backed up the important things, but not the magic internet money. Um, 
And then, you know, in 2011, and uh, basically I realized, okay, well, wait a minute, like, that's a lot of Bitcoin. You know, uh, you know, I had moved to San Francisco, I had met some people that were into it, and I was just kind of like, I should probably try and recover that. So I had that in my mind as a thing that I needed to do, right? Recover this Bitcoin. And then I was at work one day, and um, my power went out, and I was mining, and my power went out, and um, my UPS, my uninterruptible power supply, became very interruptible for some reason. <laughs> And basically, just hosed my entire rate array. Just did all of my all of my storage was corrupt, essentially. So I went through like three layers of data recovery. Like went through a data recovery service, essentially, to try and recover. Mostly, I was concerned at that time about my photos from college and things of that nature. But long story short, I lost it all. Uh, which you know, if I were holding uh, until today, which is entirely unlikely, I probably like would have ordered weed online or something like that. Uh, in between now and then. But if I didn't, I would have $3.31 million. Um, so the lesson in this is that, you know, never store in mine cryptocurrency on a mining rig, ever. Never, uh, sure, what's that? Uh, you say you had 200 Bitcoins. Does that mean that you just like mine four discrete blocks? Like every once in a while we'd be like, hey, I have 54 Bitcoins. Now. Right, so it would, would have been part of like an early mining pool. Oh, uh, likely. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I, yeah, I wasn't solo mining, I don't think. Um, yeah, I don't think I was solo mining. I think it was part of the pool. But anyway, uh, you never store mine cryptocurrency on a mining rig itself. Just never do it because it's like basically keeping your uh, whatever you would put in your safety deposit box inside a race car and giving it to like Michael Schumacher and telling him to drive around a track as fast as he can, right? Like your mining rig will eventually fail. Like it's your running hardware hard, and so like don't put important things on the thing that might break. Uh, yeah, so that's how not to lose 3.3 million dollars. <laughs> Mistakes two and three. So this week, uh, I you know I mine a bunch of different currencies. One of the currencies that I mine uh, periodically is Verge, um, and Verge, which is pretty cool, currency, privacy coin, multi algorithm. Uh, you know, so I mined it at a cost of you know a lot of zeros, nine two. Bitcoin, and then I sold it at you know what I thought a pretty decent ROI of about 13%. Sold it all at 104, an average of 104. Um, you know because basically, like in this case, I'm mounting on the cloud, and so like I need to pay my ROI and have a little bit of extra. And the more Bitcoin I have, the more mining jobs I can run, and that's just kind of like the iterative process that I go through. Well, unfortunately, next the next day, Verge began to go to the moon essentially. Um, it's, it's up 9x from, from where I sold it as of when I checked a little earlier. And you know, that mistake cost me, it actually was $31,337. So that's kind of funny. So maybe <laughs> that's worth it. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the lesson there, right? Uh, if you mine and like you rent hash rate and you happen to luck out and, 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 and finally like, you know, if you rent hash rate, like the day that you get past your ROI, it's like a victory day. You should like high five whoever is near you and have a beer and congratulate yourself because it's really hard to mine on the cloud properly. And so if you do, set aside some of the mine coins. Like if you, if you break your ROI, if you can pay the, pay, pay like, you know, get back the amount of Bitcoin that it costs to mine. Um, then you know maybe put some of it aside in case uh, it goes to the moon. Um, and then finally, uh, you know I trusted NiceHash to not get hacked, and they got hacked. Uh, I don't know if you guys know about what NiceHash is. Um, I'll talk a little about it later. But essentially, uh, NiceHash is a service where you can rent, ha you can both rent, uh, mine for them, so you you commit your mining resources to mine for them, and then you get paid basically like a market rate. So like whatever algorithm you're mining. There's an order book, essentially, like an exchange, where people are like, I will pay this for this amount of hash rate for this algorithm. And that's how people get paid. And so as a result of that, you have to have some of Bitcoin on their service in order to rent hash rate at all. And I happen to have 0 0.223 Bitcoin on there when they got hacked, which was a mistake that cost me $3,806 if I held. Uh, so the lesson here, limit your uh, limit the amount of your cryptocurrency that is held by third parties um, based on whatever your risk threshold is and work for. You know, like in this case, that's a mistake, but like I really, it could have been a lot worse. And I was smart enough to always, whenever I ran a job, mine to a wallet that I control, like in a Trezor, digital bit box, ledger, something like that. So anything, any payouts that I was receiving were mine to a hardware wallet. Um, so I, I didn't lose, like, I could have lost a lot more, basically. So, to understand how mining works, 
Uh, it's important to understand how trading works. And so this is basically how that goes. So if you've bought cryptocurrency before, or you've heard about it, um, and you're just here like trying to learn more, um, basically there are essentially three major pass-throughs uh, to get from US dollar to a cryptocurrency in the United States right now. There's another service called Local Bitcoins where you can meet people and pay them cash. Uh, if you're just starting out, I would avoid doing that because you can get robbed and stuff. But like, um, <laughs> but like, uh, you know, so Coinbase, Kraken, and Gemini are basically the three pass-throughs that get from the US dollar to crypto. And so, oh, I have to click it every time? Yes. Uh, so you get your cryptocurrency, right? You get your Bitcoin, your Ethereum, your Litecoin. On Kraken, I think you can also buy like Ripple and Stellar, or maybe a few other currencies. And then, like, you're like, I want to be a trader. Like, I've seen Wolf of Wall Street. I know how to do that. So I'm going to take my <laughs> cryptocurrency and I'm going to send it to Bitrex or Polonius. Or you could send it, you know, to the US dollar, uh, back to US dollars. So, like, maybe Bitcoin went up and you decide, well, I'm going to take this money and, you know, buy myself a Lambo. Or uh, maybe I should just hold on to this, which is probably the best idea. But uh, again, cannot provide financial advice. Um, or you decide, I'm going to gamble, I'm going to send it to Bitrex or Polonix, and I'm going to buy this like weird Doge coin that is out there right now, or any of these coins on the right, Ethereum Classic, Doge, you know, Augur, Monero. Um, and so then, you know, you basically you get your altcoin, and you're like, okay, well, what do I do now? Oh, my altcoin's gone up. I'm going to, well, I'm going to hold it, actually. Or I'm going to sell it for Bitcoin Ethereum and maybe buy a different altcoin. And that's essentially how trading works. It's just like back and forth, back and forth, trading, trading. Uh, trading your altcoins, uh, or you just hold, and that's you know probably a good idea. So, how mining works is is very similar in a way to trading, uh, but different in a few fundamental ways. So, mining uh, requires U.S. dollar and electricity, basically. So, you need money to buy hardware. Uh, so the hardware on the top is a, is a, a Bitmain Antminer S9, uh, which is a Bitcoin mining machine. Uh, they also have devices that mine Litecoin and other, other algorithms that are no longer really feasible on GPUs. The device on the bottom is a, is a six GPU uh, mining rig. And so those are typically used for you know what we would all kind of deem altcoins today. So like I don't consider a Litecoin altcoin, I consider it kind of like, it's not Bitcoin, but it's it's, it's old enough and it's like it's cemented itself in terms of like the mining power going into it to where I don't think it's an altcoin. So, so then you're like, oh, well, how do I, like, it's still pretty hard to like get a block, right? Like there's a lot of people mining it, even if it's like Zcash or something like that. Well, you gotta go and meet some friends in the pool. And so you hang out and you meet some friends in this mining pool, basically, right? And so what this is essentially is a group of people with hardware that are all trying to accomplish the same goal, which is land a block of some given cryptocurrency. And so they all work together and commit shares, what are called shares, uh, to basically um, you know, get paid whenever a block is landed. So you know, proportional to the amount of work and that proof of work that I was talking about earlier. And so then from the mining pool, you, you, know, might, you might mine, um, you know, there are mining pools like Slush Pool or a lot of other pools that you can commit um, ASIC resources to mine Bitcoin directly. Or you can mine other pools like Zpool or Mining Pool Hub where you um, are mining some altcoin and you're saying, I'm going to mine this altcoin but I want to be paid in Bitcoin or I want to be paid in Litecoin, I want to be paid in Ethereum. And that's kind of how that process works. So you get to choose like what you get paid in, right? And then if you, you know, go to this route, you can then kind of go back to the trading slide and decide, okay, well, do I want to sell all this? Do I want to make the mistake tied in and selling it before it goes to the moon? Whatever it is that you decide to do. So cloud mining uh, that I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, cloud mining is the same concept as like AWS or Google Cloud, right? So like you're basically renting hardware um, online. So like instead of paying upfront hardware costs and paying electricity bills and like you know, either being someone like me or paying someone like me to monitor your machines and make sure they're, you know, operating efficiently and profitably and not dying, exploding, catching on fire. Um, you know, you can rent on the cloud. And basically, nowadays, there are services where you can actually just pay in Bitcoin or you can pay in Litecoin or Ethereum to rent hash rate online. And then it just goes through the same workflow. So, like, you rent hash rate so you don't have 
the machines yourself, but the machines do exist, still to the mining pool and still to whatever payout currency you select. So, and just kind of like one more slide on mining versus trading. So like with trading, um, the important distinction is time in this. So with trading, when you decide I'm gonna buy some, like I'm gonna buy Doge for Bitcoin at this price. And so you say, okay, I either set a limit order to do that or I just go and be like, I wanna just buy it right now. Doge seems like a low price right now. I think it's gonna go up. When that executes, it's instantaneous. Like instantaneously, as soon as that order executes, you have whatever altcoin that you're trying to buy, right? Um, but one downside of that is you have to use exchanges a lot and that carries counterparty risk, which is you know someone else has your private keys essentially. You do not have access to, them, to that currency. So if they get hacked or they go down or the SEC intervenes and says they need to be shut down, you're kind of out of luck. Uh, mining is in a way, uh, with your own hardware, is a lot safer in terms of procuring cryptocurrency. It's a lot more work, but um, essentially what you're doing is you're spending money up front on hardware and then you're spending your time and electricity to mine coins over time. And so the analog would be if you were watching a chart, right, and you were watching like Bitcoin over time, and you were saying like, okay, well, I think Bitcoin is gonna like do this over time and maybe this and maybe this. And you set a bunch of orders. You say like, I'm gonna buy it at 16 grand, 15 grand, 14 grand, 13 grand. That's pretty close to kind of how mining works in a sense. You're basically saying like, I'm gonna mine this coin over time and get paid in, 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 in whatever I mine over time. And if you're doing a, a pool where you're auto converting to Bitcoin, you know, this distinction matters because when you look at a chart, like you, you wanna be mining something that is advantageous to you, like that will, that will offer the, the highest possible profit, right? Um, and then mining with rented hardware, uh, you know, you're spending cryptocurrency, sometimes US dollar in the, uh, in the case of, um, of uh, sorry, uh, subscription services where like you're saying like, I'll pay $10 to rent this amount of hash rate for a year. Um, you know, you're spending money up front using rent hash rate again to buy coins, a coin or coins over time. Um, and I'll, I'll get a little bit into the detail on that later. Okay, so about the crypto and cryptocurrency. This is a lot of stuff to put in one slide. Uh, and I'm gonna do my best because I really wanted to focus on mining and not so much like how cryptocurrency works. Um, but it's important to understand how cryptocurrency works. So, blockchain. What is a blockchain? Blockchain is a bunch of pieces, containers that have data in them. And what blockchain is in relation to cryptocurrency is those blocks contain transaction records, the records of all transactions that have occurred since the last block. And the crypto part comes in when you deal with the proof of work aspect where you're trying to mine those blocks. You're trying to basically get the encrypted hash associated with the block in order to get paid. And uh, basically, in this case, it gets into uh, the private key, public key, uh, key cryptography, sorry, cryptography where Everyone knows the algorithm that's being used when you're mining, and so you're trying to generate feasible hashes that might be the hash of the encrypted data and um, nonce or difficulty associated with that block. Um, and so there's a bunch of encryption algorithms out there. SHA-256 for Bitcoin, Script for Litecoin, there's Equihash, there's like uh, Lyra 2 v 2 Blake 2S, there's all these different algorithms out there that are different encryption algorithms, different cryptocurrency use, different, different cryptocurrencies used, and it's, the important distinction here is that different computers, different graphics cards are good at mining different algorithms. Like they're better, like you know, my NVIDIA 1080 Ti is better than an AMD card at mining Equihash. It's like really good for that. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of how that works basically. And so, like what is in a block? I talked about is transactions. Um, and so basically if you think about it, it's sort of the same idea as like a password. Like, when you type your password in, when, when, when a, a company stores your password, they're not typically storing your password itself, they're storing a hash of that password, which is like encrypted with an algorithm, essentially, that only you can be able, like it, it is entirely improbable that anyone can guess that hash, basically. And so like you're the only one that can access that. And it's the same idea with cryptocurrency, is that it's encrypted, uh, and then the hash associated with that encryption, if someone guesses it right, it's like extremely improbable that anyone would have been able to reverse engineer that. Um, and get to that hash. You had a question? Um, is ASIC better than the CPU in terms of like 
So, uh, yeah, ASICs are better at... Can you repeat the question on the microphone? Yes. Uh, the question was, are ASICs better than GPUs? And so, ASICs are better at mining what they mine than GPUs are, is the short answer to that question. So, like, like, ASICs are better at mining Bitcoin than a GPU is at mining a Bitcoin. ASICs are better at mining Litecoin than a GPU is at mining Bitcoin, or uh, mining Litecoin. And there's a bunch of other algorithms out there and coins associated with them where ASICs are just faster. They're, they're more power, you know, you're talking about what you're looking at essentially is a kilowatt to hash ratio, right? Like you want to maximize the amount of hashes you can have, but you also have to consider power, you know, whether you have to pay for power or you have free power, that's the whole optimization there's a slide at the end, I'll get into that. But, um, you know, if you wanted to mine Bitcoin and you wanted like a plug and play machine that would just do that, you know, an ASIC could be an option. They're just expensive and they eat a lot of power. And the ones that consumers buy, like are typically like one generation older than like what you know Bitmain has in their data center in China. Like they have the hot stuff, like the new stuff. They're selling off the stuff that's one generation old, basically. They're not selling the fastest race cars. They're selling you know the race cars that have been in a couple accidents and like you know need to be offloaded, basically. Yeah, ASIC makers aren't selling the ASICs that they make them. They usually hold on and mine on them for a while yeah. because it ends up being more fun. Because it's an appreciating asset, right? Like we're talking about an asset class that is, you know, doing this right now. And so it, they make way more off mining with their own hardware than they do selling that hardware to, to us. Yeah, once, once the uh, coin becomes ASIC mining, <laughs> um, your ability to GPU mine it is nearly nothing. So yeah. You can my buddy Alex, who's also a miner, just said, and I just want to repeat that, like, once a coin becomes ASIC mineable, basically you should forget about mining it on a GPU. So, basically you go from your mining rig to mining a coin on a specific algorithm. You're trying to guess the, the, ha the encrypted uh, hash of the block contents, um, validating transactions, and in the case of, of different currencies, you're doing some other things. Uh, so like in the case of Monero or Zcash, you're also working to make transactions private. Um, so the computers are doing a little bit of extra work to make sure that, um, you know, in the case of Monero, the, the, the joke saying is uh, from, an unknown, from an unknown location to an unknown location, basically, because it's entirely private. Um, or in the case of Ethereum or Golem, you're performing some computing task. Like in the case of Ethereum, there are applications that run on the Ethereum network. In the case of Golem, they're trying to do decentralized rendering. So like a small graphics shop in New York that can't afford to like have their own hardware and AWS is too expensive because people out here in San Francisco are spending a bunch of money to do deep learning on that stuff. Um, they have another avenue to rent um, the computing power that they need to perform their rendering task. And then finally, um, you know, recently as, uh, as of like, um, I'm not sure where the PowerPoint started, I believe it was a couple years ago, but that's relatively recent in this space, um, storing data. So there's like storage mining now where you, you know, you, you partition off a certain chunk of your storage, like let's say you have a NAS at home or something like that, like a, a network accessible storage device that has like five hard drives in it. You can partition off a certain chunk of that and just serve that up to the cloud and be your own like kind of cloud storage provider and get paid in the cryptocurrency. And so Magic Internet Money Wizard Man says your quest is to find a hash with a, with a value less than the current target, which I will tell you what that means in a moment, uh, comparing it to the hash in the next block, and if your hash is less than the target hash, essentially, you win. Uh, if the pool that it, you are mining with also guesses the correct hash, you win. Uh, and so, you know, when you mine for a pool, you, you're basically committing work, and there's a chance that you might get the next block but there's also a chance that someone else might get it, and the whole reason that people mine for pools is that the work is distributed in such a way that it's distributed intelligently, and the profits are split, split equitably among everyone based on the amount of work that they put in. So what the fuck do miners do, right? I'm sorry for there's a kid back there, my bad, for the cursing. Uh, okay. Sorry, what do miners do? Uh, so, so miners use hardware to try and guess a cryptographic hash of block data. Vote on network changes, so what that means is like maybe some, maybe you have your own Bitcoin mining uh, machine, like an ASIC at home, and you're like, Segwit2x, that seems like a stupid idea. You can actually vote, like you can signal with your mining device to say, I don't support this change in the network. And it's a really important distinction because people often wonder, like how are these decisions made? And 
it gets back to the point of centralizing a thing that was intended to be decentralized because the pools will kind of decide among themselves, make like political decisions basically on what they support. So like Slush Pool, for example, famously came out and said, we are not going to signal for Segwit 2x. We believe it's detrimental to Bitcoin and we're not going to signal it. Whereas if you talk about the miners in China, a lot of them wanted Segwit 2x and so they will signal for it. And then this manipulation goes on where you know, it makes it look like miners are signaling for things that they aren't, things of that nature. And so that's the voting aspect. So all that Bitcoin does, uh, all that Bitcoin miners do is they maintain and secure a ledger, a record of transactions that is permanent and available to everyone in the world to see. And that's really all it does. It's a lot of computing power to perform that task. That task, like Bitcoin doesn't process that many tra transactions per second or per 10 minutes. Like, you, you know, you could feasibly com like do that task on way less computing power than exists right now. Um, it's just that because it's you know equitable, because there's profit uh, involved, more people are trying to mine. And that's the reason that so much power is being burned every day to mine Bitcoin. Uh, and Litecoin and Zcash kind of fall in this category as well. In the case of Zcash and uh, Monero, there's also some privacy stuff that's being done. Um, and this, this is basically the case, the first bullet is basically the case for most mineable coins. Um, and then in addition to what Bitcoin does, Ethereum basically does what Bitcoin does, and they allow you to have this kind of like world Ethereum computer uh, idea where you can like run your application, or you can make up uh, crypto cats and sell them, or make them collectible in some way. Or you can uh, you know, render things in the case of Golem. And then finally, you know, back to the idea of storing data. So you know, storage, or Filecoin, or Saya are examples of cloud storage solutions where you can, um, and Chia, which is not out yet, but will be, um, to like you know store stuff online, do some of the computing stuff, but it's more focused on storage, um, which actually is a, interesting to just bring up that you know this is kind of like a new um, thought, uh, like idea behind mining because we are burning a lot of electricity every day just to mine this magic internet money, right? And so it's way cheaper, it's way less electricity to spin hard drives than it is to run GPUs or ASICs. And so, like these new ideas um, are kind of like looking at, well, what if we can use something that's cheaper electricity-wise, but still, you know, profitable for people so they'll actually do it. <laughs> okay, so like you probably came to this meetup not to hear me talk about the history of Bitcoin and mining and all that stuff, but how to actually get started mining. So you've made it through, and we're going to get into that now. So there's basically. Uh, you know, four ways to, uh, five ways, but it only shows four right now, of uh, mining. So I like to call them the fanboy fangirl method, which is, I really think Zcash is awesome, or Dogecoin is awesome, and I'm just gonna mine it. I think that it's cool, and it will go up in value. So I wanna support that network. Like, you know, I have a friend, uh, you know, that, uh, that started uh, Z Classic, and so like, I like to mine Z Classic sometimes. Like, I do believe it will go up in value, but I also like to make sure that, you know, I dedicate hash rate to his network every once in a while to ensure that transactions are processed quickly and stuff like that. Then there's the going long method, which is, you know, what we all wanna do, which is like, you know, pick a coin correctly that, you know, you think will be worth more money later, and you mine it and hold it and then sell it for Bitcoin or go back to US dollar. Uh, this is a very dangerous game, but it, it does work sometimes. And then there's the instant gratification method, where like, you know that you want to hold a certain amount of cryptocurrency, but like, you don't really want to deal with holding a bunch of altcoins. Uh, and so, in this method, you basically pick a coin or algorithm that's worth the most Bitcoin right now, um, or will be worth the most Bitcoin for the duration of your mining job and then either sell what you mine on an exchange or use a pool that auto-converts to Bitcoin. Uh, and then there's easy mode, which is mining for a service like NiceHash, uh, which just came back online today uh, after being hacked, and, uh, or mining rig rentals, and there's a couple other services out there as well. And then finally, there's the advanced combo move, <laughs> which is combining the above methods in a way that you think will maximize profit. And that's why you're doing this thing. So how do you get started mining? Well, there's really th uh, three ways. Well, you know, there's owning your own hardware. So this is what I like to do, right? Like, I do this because I like it. I like making computers do things and making them run and not break and run really, really, really fast. Uh, it's like this with many things in my life. Skis, cars, paintball guns, like all sorts of stuff where it's just like, I'm a tinkerer. I like to make machines go. 
And so, you know, if you go this route, basically you can build a computer with one or more graphic uh, GPUs, graphic processing units, uh, and start mining cryptocurrency. You can also buy an ASIC. Um, there's several options for that. They, they sell them on eBay all the time. Uh, you know, I, the only word of caution I would issue is that, like, when you buy an ASIC, typically you're buying it like, and it's at least sec at least second generation from current, like, you know, one generation older than current, and you know, maybe third generation older than current. And if you do um, decide, like, well, I don't know if I want to mess with owning hardware right now. I don't know how to manage it. I don't even know how to build a computer. Well, you can rent hash rate online. And so there's a couple ways to do it. There's really two categories. There's subscription-based and order-based. Uh, so subscription-based is you're basically saying that, um, I didn't start my timer, so I have no idea how long it's going. Yeah, keep going. Anyway, uh, subscription-based uh, is saying like, okay, I want to reserve hash rate for a year. Like I want to pay, you're going to pay some amount of US dollar up front to say I'm going to mine Bitcoin for a year. And like, maybe that's profitable, maybe it isn't. Um, I've heard uh, that People get pretty decent returns doing this. I have never done the subscription-based method personally, so I, I can't say for sure. Um, when I rent, I do order-based um, renting, which is basically saying, I want to mine uh, on this algorithm for this duration of time because I believe that I can make more in cryptocurrency than it costs me to rent. Uh, and so you need to decide, like, what cryptocurrency do you want to be paid in? This is a pretty important distinction because, like, they fluctuate all the time, right? So, like. When you mine, do you really like want to be paid in the currency that's going like up and then will go down again, or do you want to be paid in a currency that's like devalued and might be worth more later? Um, and so, you know, then you, if you own your own hardware, you got to determine what your hardware mines best, uh, and then pick a target pool that meets your needs. And there's just a lot of pools out there. I list some on here. These slides are going to be public. Um, after this talk is over, uh, so you can Google any of these names and kind of research. Um, you know, what they mine, and how that fits into your workflow, risk profile, things of that nature. Or easy mode is, um, you know, the easiest way for new miners is just to build a machine and then run the executable that NiceHash has as an example, and it just will venture mark your machine for you, do all that stuff, and then just when it runs, it automatically algorithm switches. So like anytime Zcash is worth more than like some other coin, Generally, people are paying more to rent that hash rate, and so uh, you know, then your computer will switch to mining something that's more lucrative for you. Uh, okay, so here's an example of uh, something I did today, just for the sake of showing you guys um, how you can really have different amounts of earnings depending on what you do. So I didn't like intentionally choose these uh, to make a difference. I just I happen to mine Z Classic and I happen to happen to mine Verge. So I have you know I took two video cards, uh, both Nvidia GTX 1080 Ti, which are like reasonably top of the line consumer grade video cards, uh, and I mine Verge, Taj, and Neva via Blake 2S, which is an encryption algorithm, on Zpool, which is a pool, uh, getting paid in Bitcoin. And then with the second card, I mine Z Classic via Equihash on Supernova.cc, which is another pool, paying in Z, Z Classic. And that's actually the only way that Supernova pays you. You're, you're, you're actually mining like direct to the blockchain of um, that particular coin. And so my power cost was 30 cents per card uh, for the amount of time that transpired. So however many hours is between 1.45 and 7.12 p.m. And you know, GPU one earned uh, this amount of Bitcoin. Okay. Uh, so 000169, which uh, you know you guys can do the math on that. It's not a lot, but it's definitely well above 30 cents. Um, and you know the Z Classics didn't do so well. Four zeros and then eight seven. Though you know I hope that one day Z Classic will go up in value because I think it's pretty cool. So why is there a difference? Like you know shouldn't it all be like shouldn't the market kind of all stabilize all this stuff? Well, if you look at exchanges and you look at um, price charts, you know that sometimes the stuff does not make sense. Like, why things are going up? Why is Dogecoin up 43% today? I don't know. Uh, and so there's a bunch of variables that go into determining how to maximize profit. They include network difficulty. Uh, so network difficulty is basically um, an idea essentially of how difficult is it to actually mine, uh, we'll say a block of Bitcoin in this example. And that has to do with how many other people are mining Bitcoin in the world right now? How many people on your pool are mining Bitcoin? 
So you take that number, everyone, and then you take your pool number, and then you divide the two and you figure out, okay, well, I have a one in whatever chance of my pool landing a block of Bitcoin. And then you have your hash rate on top of that, which is a subset of the pool's hash rate. And so you have to basically figure out, uh, which unfortunately you guys are gonna have to do for yourselves, because I can't tell you everything, um, like, <laughs> where is a good face? Uh, like, what is the most profitable way to mine? And it has to do a lot with network, network difficulty. Uh, block time has a lot to do with it as well. So Bitcoin blocks are every 10 minutes. Who knows of a coin that has a faster than 10 minute block time? Uh, Ethereum. Ethereum, Litecoin, yeah, Doge. It would be another example, Doge is one minute. They're, they're coins that are, that are every 30 seconds, in fact, uh, block times. Why do you think this matters? Why would block time matter in mining and, and determining how much money you make? Uh, the more you mine, the more you make. Mm -hmm. So, uh, sort of. So, with um, if you think about it this way, right? Let's say you're entering a foot race, and you're racing against people that are way faster than you and some people that are slower than you, but you just do one race because like, you can only afford to try and mine Bitcoin with your mining rental for this period of time. So you're gonna have a certain probability of landing a block, but an alternative is to mine all coins that have like 30 second block times, one minute block times. Then all of a sudden, you're not in one foot race, you're in like 50 foot races. And you have the ability to change what you're mining at any given time and not be penalized for that, right? If, you're half, if the network of Bitcoin is halfway through mining a Bitcoin block, and then your machine dies, or you just decide you have to turn it off, or whatever, you're kind of screwed. You sunk all this power into trying to mine this coin, and then you're not gonna reach the payout period, so you're not gonna get anything. Whereas with coins that have faster block times, you get the opportunity to like get a chance every time there's a block, and you know switch to something else and not really be penalized because everything is operating on a much faster frequency. Um, I think it's so, obvious too, but the block time determines the transaction time too. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a good point Alex made. Uh, block time also determines transaction time. So like, you know, Bitcoin, if you guys have sent Bitcoin around, you know sometimes it can be pretty slow, particularly when Coinbase all of a sudden issues a bunch of Bitcoin cash to people and they decide they want to move some money around. Uh, and so, you know, the Bitcoin network, for all of its merits, is pretty slow now, you know. Uh, whereas if you use something like Litecoin or Stellar or Verge or any number of coins, Dogecoin is really fast too. Like it, in a minute, it can be from point A to point B confirmed, you know. And so you know that has something to do with um, you know selecting your payout coin. Like how quickly do you want to be paid out? How you know quickly do you want to like limit the amount of time that the service that you're using is holding your coins? Or if you're trying to use like a point of sale transaction. Right, yeah, if we get pie in the sky where like one day like vendors are accepting cryptocurrency, then be like, yeah, it matters. Like it matters to like, you know, if I'm gonna pay for some skis with a crypto, you know, the owner of the ski shop isn't really cool with me being like, so yeah, I don't get here. Uh, I mean, I paid the economic, the econ, uh, the econ fees, so like maybe tomorrow. <laughs> no, can't buy a coffee with that. Uh, and so market price and volatility goes into it, power cost and rig efficiency go into it. The counterparty risk, risk of being hacked, and human error are all variables that go into mining profitably. So here's an example. I've been using a lot, putting a lot of words on the screen. So this is, uh, these are two charts. So the chart on the top is Verge's price chart uh, over the, about the last uh, seven days, I would say. And the chart below is the difficulty chart for mining Verge. So the numerical value associated with how difficult it is to mine a Verge block. And you'll notice that they're kind of moving with one another, right? Does anyone have an idea of what this means? So when something's worth more money, more people want it, right? And if more people want it, it's harder to get it. And that's basically the idea behind mining, is that like, you have to decide, like, at any given time, is it most profitable to mine, like, this coin that's going, like, vertical? Or are too many people mining it, and does it make more sense to maybe mine a different coin that's on the same algorithm that might pump, like, afterwards or something like that? Um, and so it's important to watch difficulty to know, like, what's going on with the network. So basically, you have to watch a lot of stuff. It's not easy, but it's super fun. And, um, you know, if you, you can avoid all these problems uh, of like things that I have to deal with on a daily basis, 
but simply if you have a mining rig, if you have a GPU, um, just mining for like mining rig rentals or nice hash, where it's basically like they're just going to pay you whatever they determine is most, you know, most profitable at any given time. You don't have to worry about it. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, go forth and mine if that's what you want to do. I really think mining is awesome. Like we're supporting the networks, right? So like the whole reason that people like me exist is it's like a new economy where like people like me, gearheads that like to build computers and make them do things, can support financial networks uh, in the form of making my computer do work. And uh, yeah, so that's basically my presentation. Um, I, anybody have questions? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, you go back a slide. <coughs> Like that, that to me is really interesting. Um, then you're just solving some optimization problem. You know what's the most value per difficulty uh, mm -hmm. across all the different coins? Is there somebody that is going? Mm -hmm. uh, like where, where does this data come from? Is it, it, are you able to compute it just based on the network itself? Can you just serve the network or is there an aggregator? Or, uh, where do these charts come from? Oh, okay. Well, these charts come from, uh, the, the chart on the top comes from TradingView, which is like if you like to trade or you like to look at charts, um, it's a really good site. I mean, you have to pay a subscription, but it's worth it because their charts are really good and the site's always up. Like, you know, if, if you use Coinbase, like, you know that when market the market is really active and you're trying to look at the charts on GDAX, it's like, which is their exchange, it's like a nightmare, right? Like the page will just die, like all sorts of stuff will happen. But the thing is on the back end, their APIs are still working. And so services like TradingView kind of come in and allow you to be able to see charts on the fly, regardless of what exchange is crashing, getting DDoS or whatever. Uh, the chart at the bottom is from um, uh, Coin Wars, which is a, a site that, that does different things in terms of uh, giving you, uh, you know, profitability estimations based on what hardware you have and stuff like that. So there are services out there um, that do some of this stuff for you. Really, it's just kind of like, um, you gotta piece it together. You're, like, I mean, I can't, unfortunately I can't tell you like all the sources I use because like, I don't know who's watching this online and if someone with like more programming expertise than me like knows everything that I know, then like all of a sudden what I know is way less valuable and I make less money and then I have to eat ramen noodles. So like, you know. So there's still an advantage of uh, like knowledge in the space. Right. Okay. Yeah, so like, you know, you gotta build something. I mean like, you can't really do this as a human being with web pages open being like, that looks right. Go. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. You gotta. Right. Right. Accessible. You have some supervisor that's like, oh, let's find this one now because it's the best. Mm -hmm. so, Right, so like, well, you know, I built my own recommender essentially that, that does this for me, or does a lot of this stuff for me, but you still have to use your intuition and stuff like that. So, I think that segues to my second question, if I can ask you. Um, so the mining client software, mm -hmm. um, is the majority of it open source, uh, and uh, how do you go about like benchmarking it in terms of like, oh, some new graphics architecture, you've got the, uh, the, the, the Titan V or whatever, it's out, and so mm -hmm. maybe the GPU implementation of it algorithm is insufficient then you want to try to optimize the, the client to, to, to pick its own algorithm? Like is there a standard way to go about doing that? So, so repeat the question. Yeah, just one second. I'm gonna repeat the question for all those on the internet. Uh, so the question was, uh, are mine is mining software, the software that you actually run on a rig to mine cryptocurrency open source? And the answer to that is usually yes. Uh, in the case of NiceHash, it is not, um, but for the most part, they're open source miners that are built by people. And a lot of times these miners are built um, as part of a challenge. So like a new coin comes out and there's a bounty associated with building the most efficient GPU miner for NVIDIA, as an example. And so the people that build these things get paid like a certain amount of cryptocurrency for building the most efficient one. And there's, there's competitions and stuff. And yeah, you gotta pay attention to like releases of miners, you know, when a new CUDA architecture, like new CUDA update comes out for NVIDIA, you know, you need to be watching the miners that you use to see like how they updated. And as soon as they do update, you know, you download the new one, you run it, you see if it's faster than the old one. If it is, then you switch. And is there a place to go to, like on GitHub? Or they're on GitHub, yeah. They're all, they're all on GitHub, basically. Yeah, so. uh, it's on GitHub and the, usually the miners will post a Bitcoin talk. And so let's say like something like Titan V or Vulture or Terminator comes out, 
usually uh, the miner itself has to be updated to use the new card. Is majority of this stuff run on Linux or Windows? Or? <laughs> it's actually a lot of it's on Windows. Surprisingly, <laughs> surprisingly, a large large amount of it runs on Windows. And the reason for that is, I think, it's sort of like a legacy thing. So like gamers run Windows. Largely, like uh, I mean, gamers that run games that don't run an OS X or Linux run Windows, and so gamers have GPUs, and so like there's a market there, you know. But a lot of the miners run on. I mean, most of them run on Linux as well. Uh, surprisingly, uh, very few run on OS X. Or maybe not surprisingly, because there's just not a lot of like, you know, like most people with OS X are running on laptops. So like, you know, you're not mining with a laptop. Yeah, there's like Mac or whatever the the Mac desktops are that have like Radeon cards and then that maybe could mine, but there's not a lot of miners that are out there for OSX. Yeah, uh, any other questions? Cool, well thank you for the opportunity to talk here. It's really fun. And, uh, I hope that this is helpful. Um, if you have any other questions, I also put this silly game I created, which I'm not going to go through, but you can look at the slides. I made, made up, I made up like a D and D coin that like you can kind of go through the exercise of what a hashing algorithm is doing by dice rolls and Superman versus Batman. So like you can, uh, I was going to play this out, but it seems unmanageable. So you can look at the slides and you know play at home or whatever. Um, and if you have any questions, my Twitter handle is at Yorktronic, so Y-O-R-K-T-R-O-N-I-C. It's on the first slide in this presentation. I'm always open to talking about mining. I love it too much, so. <laughs> we also have uh, one more guest that's gonna update us with a brain dump of everything that's happening. Give it up for Tony Rose. Thank, thank you, Dan, for inviting me to come talk tonight. Um, much like he's uh, obsessed with mining, um, I'm kind of obsessed with blockchain for the past 12 months or a little bit longer. Um, so just a bit of background. Um, entrepreneur, been in emerging tech in the you know, Bay Area for about 20 years or so. Um, discovered blockchain about two or three years ago and uh, kind of decided to become well, I'm not sure if I decided to become obsessed with it, but the more I learned about it, the more and more interesting it became to me. Um, as the next wave of tech that's going to really create an opportunity to make the world better in so many interesting ways. Um, so I, I've started really just researching, studying, and uh, found that the job I was at wasn't really into um, you know investing in blockchain, so I, I left and was gonna spend a lot of time just you know, continuing to research. So I, I built a site, airways.io, where I kind of categorized a lot of uh, blockchain projects. And um, I found this company recently, Juvo, that is uh, a traditional company. They're not doing anything with blockchain, but um, they're all about financial inclusion. And you know, I got a, a gig there where I'm looking at how does blockchain serve the, the mission of financial inclusion so it's really given me the opportunity to continue and um, just just explore the space and become knowledgeable about you know, the cool stuff and the innovations that are going on. Um, you know, Juva, what they do is they provide microloans in the form of airtime minutes to people that are in emerging markets. So if your cell phone is about to run out of airtime, you have to walk down to the local you know, top-up place, they'll put a dollar on your phone and you would pay that back to them. So. Um, you know, they allow people to develop identities, uh, financial identities and credit scoring um, where they wouldn't before. And so there's kind of financial inclusion. So what's the overlap of financial inclusion and uh, blockchain? I'll get to that later. Um, but that just is kind of a bit of a introduction in terms of like kind of what I'm looking at day to day. Um, but what I wanted to talk, you know, t uh, touch on tonight was just two really cool things that I, I saw happen in the crypto space. The last couple of weeks, um, you know, Crypto Kitties, <laughs> uh, you know, this sort of all of a sudden uh, took off. Um, I, I sort of, you know, perused Twitter, Reddit, and Facebook quite a bit, and I just saw this one, one Thursday night, I saw this thing about like, Crypto Kitties, what's that? And um, I logged into the site, and before I knew it, I had spent my son's $600 worth of uh, Ethereum I had given him on his, uh, uh, <laughs> on his um, you know, MetaMask account, and 
I was like trading crypto kitties and breeding crypto kitties, and all of a sudden I had like 50 crypto kitties, and I was like, you're gonna go to college by selling crypto kitties, and you know, and, and all of a sudden, um, you know, the Ethereum network just like stopped working, you know, for, I did have the like, crypto kitties launch for, for two days, right, like on, on day three it gone viral, and like Ethereum network, like ICOs were like, you know, rescheduling their launch, and you know, all this like crazy stuff. Um, but I was like, wow, it's like, what is this? And so, kind of a bit later, I heard about ERC721 and how that was like the technology behind CryptoKitties. And, um, you know, I kind of like was thinking about it, I was like, wow, it's, it's just so interesting. That's, that's a new use case of tokenization. Um, so I started like looking into it more and I just thought, wow, like, not only is CryptoKitties the first kind of consumer friendly way that people can get exposed to cryptocurrency, um, but it's also like a new type of token on Ethereum. So it's two pretty cool things. Um, and people will think CryptoKitties are you know, pretty silly. And it, they are, but on the other hand, like how do you get someone to care about you know, buying some Ethereum, setting it you know, to an offline wallet or, or to a different wallet than, than Coinbase, you know, to like figure out what is a recovery seed and like just have that experience in a way they care about because just collecting Ethereum or Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash it was awesome. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it isn't interesting to, to most people, but you know, when you get collectibles and a kind of a game format that, that makes it accessible and it exposes more people to crypto, which I think is, is really important. Um, <coughs> you know, the idea of taking custodianship of your assets and just having that experience of being responsible for you know, crypto assets is, is uh, a very important mental shift that people need to go through uh, before they get why we are so excited about crypto. Um, so what is the ERC721 uh, format? Um, kind of the main thing about it is that it's non-fungible. Um, that's sort of like a, a funny word, but fungibility is, is something that is a, a function of you know, what, what real true money has. So if I have a $20 bill and you have a $20 bill, they're you know, from an economic perspective, indistinguishable from each other. Like if you give that $20 bill or that $20 bill to the guy at the bar, he's gonna give you the equivalent, um, you know, whatever 20 bucks worth of beer is. He's not gonna say, oh, I don't like that $20 bill, but I'll take that one. And if one's dirty and ripped up, maybe, but the idea of fungibility is that all units of the currency are, are equal. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting with, with Bitcoin, it's actually kind of not completely fungible because you can trace the transaction history of coins it's, it's feasible that some of those coins could go through North Korea and then they would be like, oh, bad coins. And that's not really what, what money needs to be. So you know, this is part of the reason why things like Monero and Zcoin and privacy coins are important is because they actually provide fungibility to cryptocurrency. Um, so that's a quick lesson on you know, what's, what's fungible. And, and why is ERC-71, you know, relative to that is um, it's, it's non-fungible. So ERC-721 lets you create a token on Ethereum that is, is actually distinguishable. So you can have, you know, this is, this is what CryptoKitty is. It's actually a single kind of token that is unique. So you can have collectible cats um, or other types of collectible games. <coughs> but you can, you can also have marketplaces where you can have a single unit of account but different types of you know flavors of that of that token. So, you know, one example I saw when I was kind of researching this talk was um, marketplaces for power, right? So, you may have units of power denominated in a token, and maybe one token equals one kilowatt. But if that kilowatt was generated by a wind turbine versus a solar, it might have a different unit value exchange, or perhaps a different kind of tax structure or something like that. Um, if you had to create a different ERC twenty token, you'd have to be you know, doing an exchange and different things like that. So it just creates a very interesting new uh, crypto toy for us to play with, with our apps and products. Um, so <clears throat> that's my sort of brained up on ERC721. Um, I'll, I'll take questions from on that and then I'll talk about cross-chain atomic swaps. Are there any other games? Yeah. <laughs> um, I bet you we're gonna see a ton of them coming. Um, I'm not sure about on Ethereum, right? Because I think people might be afraid of them going viral and crashing the, the network again. So I think the network should crash. It, it, it definitely should, and like this definitely got me talking. Others to start talking about like things besides like um, I don't know, 
uh, you know, researching like the consensus protocols and things like that. So like from a prioritization, scaling the Ethereum network, it's yeah. it's a good thing. Like it's, I did hear some things about the roadmap kind of shifting around and the priorities changing. So um, and I, I'm not sure what they did. I don't understand the the mining and the the, the throughput adjustments of Ethereum as well, but. They were tweeting about um, the, the rate increasing, so I'm not sure how that's happening dynamically on Ethereum, but um, if someone does, it'd be what they hear about. Have you seen any other uses of the token? I haven't seen any, and I didn't have enough time to research it as I was hoping um, to do, but I, I did hear that one example where for like power mm -hmm. exchanges, yeah. that was the only one other one I actually read about. Cool. But someone posted a Medium article like here's a source code for CryptoKitties. You know, create your own CryptoKitties game. So, <laughs> I, I think you know it's just it's inevitable that we'll see probably, you know, if anyone's clever, they're probably trying to get it out before Christmas because so everyone's stuck at home like collecting Doji Dog coins or right. you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's, and, there's definitely yeah, there's definitely opportunity for you know I think about a game like, like a game like Hearthstone or something like that where like you have a, a, a trading card game yeah. where where. Um, you know, maybe not all the trading cards need to be unique, uh, you know, maybe they're shared trading cards that are like not cryptographically unique um, mm -hmm. because they're common cards, you know, common is like the, you know, class of the card um, in like Hearthstone or whatever, but maybe there's like ultra rare ones that are unique that only, you know, it's like going back to the 90s and Magic the Gathering where you would buy yeah. cases and cases and cases of cards but then you get like that one card that only five other people in the world have, you know. And so, like, I think that there's definitely an opportunity for that, not only from the collectible perspective, but actually generating, like, a card game like a, that you can play against anyone online with your deck, essentially, that you've built over time on the ERC network. So, that's, that's yeah, like, cool. Like so, so you're talking about, like, a hybrid, like, some of them are ERC-20s, they're the same, and then some of yeah. them are of the other kind. Or can you have yeah. some of, of the type that you're talking about, but have multiple, so you, you have, like, a very limited... Uh, I guess that would be an ERC-20 with uh, like a, a, a limited quantity per type, right? I mean, you know, with issue, I guess, like a some yeah. sort of amount of... This is like selling houses versus money, right? Because you can only have one house. There's only one plot of land that one house can sell. Right. And like I've heard of like asset registries where they, they do things and they're represented as, as tokenized, you know, ownerships. Um, but yeah, so this is, might be a way to actually tokenize, you know, assets like your house. Mm -hmm. right? you, you give it a unique house token on Zillow, and you like say, hey, um, rather than taking that second mortgage, I'm gonna like take, you know lock up my house in some sort of smart contract and right. like yeah. put it on a marketplace. Or yeah, or you know, moving the you know you sell your house and moving the value of yeah. you know what you're getting paid. Totally. via a token that's redeemable and going all outside all of the traditional mechanisms of yeah, wire true. transfers and escrow and things of that nature. It's, you know, you know basically stock contract escrow. Yeah, there's there's definitely some projects I've heard about that are doing real estate and allowing you to buy fractional you know, real estate. Uh, I haven't looked at them too deeply, but super interesting, right? Like, um, and, and projects that are letting you you know, take out mortgages in a peer to peer place, but you, like the thing is, you still can't get around the fact that some central authority needs to have a legal right to go and sell your house if you don't pay. So right. that's an interesting part of that whole cool, cool thing. Okay. So um, I'm talking about cross chain atomic swaps, um, and, and in general, just this idea of decentralized exchanges, right? Because we were talking earlier about like, oh well. You know, there's only like really two ways to get your hands on some, some Bitcoin, you either mine it or go to Coinbase or Kraken or um, Gemini. And um, you know, maybe you get your hands on some, some, some Bitcoin and you want to get yourself some, some Bitcoin cash. And you got to, you know, now Coinbase supports this, you can like do an exchange where you're going to pay an exchange fee. Uh, or maybe you want to send your Bitcoin off to your wallet. It's going to cost you 30 bucks in mining fees, um, which a cross chain atomic swap still will. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, the, the point is that you can do exchanges without needing um, either, even if you're using like um, Changely or Evercoin or um, Shapeshift, there's still a short period of time where someone has the asset and they're doing the exchange for you and they're charging you fees on top of, you know, the mining fees for that service. So, 
decentralized exchanging is, is a super interesting area of the space. Um, I think there's really kind of two ways I've heard that are being explored. One is like this cross-chain atomic swap method. Um, and this other one are, are decentralized protocols, um, like 0x or ZRx has a protocol for, I think, just Ethereum tokens um, that allows for the network, or, or just for the protocol to allow people to build um, you know, UIs that would submit orders to sort of a global order book that would fulfill them. So there's like the protocol kind of kind of way being explored and a couple of projects, I think, I think Xerox is getting pretty close to having a beta or something. Um, and AirSwap is another one that I, that I heard of. Um, and Bancor, I think, is doing something similar. Um, but the cross-chain atomic swap is something kind of different. It's not a protocol. It's not trying to create like a, a network. Um, it's it's taking a smart contract on each chain, and then you know both parties sort of go through this um, step set of operations where they're locking what they want to exchange. And they agreed upon you know, the exchange of you know, you know x number of whatever for y number of the other thing. And they follow this smart contract protocol where on chain one, so I'll sort of just walk through how it works um, at a high level. The details are pretty technical and I've been actually trying to read about it and like really understand it <laughs> and actually do it, um, but I'm not quite there yet. Um, but I just want to talk again talk about it because like the first ever one was on a Bitcoin Cash a few weeks ago and I think a month or two ago the first ever one was on a Litecoin and I think Decred had, had done it before, so it's, it's really new. Um, and just the fact that it's people are doing them on test nets and kind of creating code bases that, that do this is pretty exciting. Um, so basically what it was is, if I want to trade you know, from chain A to chain B, the same Bitcoin cash to Bitcoin. Um, you know, the first step is a person that I'm trading with, we agree on you know, the price that we're gonna trade for. So then I would then lock um, you know, certain number of Bitcoin Cash on the Bitcoin Cash chain, I would lock it for, let's just say, 24 hours. Um, let's just say 48, because the other guy locks it for half of that. So the, the refund happens automatically if the second step of the exchange doesn't happen. Um, so I would put, you know, this contract you know, is going to go to him, and if it doesn't get fulfilled, it comes back to me. And I put, his, I put inside of it um, the hash of the secret. And so then that's, that's that part. And then then I send the guy um, the hash of the secret. And so then he does the same thing, but he puts in the contract in that chain, you know, my address on that chain is the recipient of the contract, and his address says the recipient of the contract's not fulfilled in 24 hours. Um, and then that's, then both contracts are, are done. And then um, what happens next is he audits my contract and makes sure that the values that we said would happen happen. And then I I have the, right, the ability to then, this, I'm actually a little bit confused on exactly how this works because the way that it went through the steps in the post on, on the Decred exchange, like at this point now I go and I can I have the, I can use the code. So the Decred example, like he went and used the code and it would unlock that contract and send me the, um, the output and would also give me the private key. And so I don't know how, at this point, that person can't just not unlock the other one. So yeah, I was working on the presentation. I hope to have some slides and kind of ran out of time today, but I wanted to at least get through as far as I had figured it out <laughs> and kind of leave it also, just because it says it's a you know, crypto builders hack up, hacker meetup. Like, I don't have all the answers, but it's definitely a really cool stuff. Um, you know, I, I encourage people to check it out. and. Maybe if I get one working, I'll actually come and do it, <laughs> you know, live. And that'd, be, that'd be pretty cool. So it's kind of my next step is to, to do that. But um, from a high level, I hope that explains generally how it works. The cryptography is pretty, you know, it's pretty detailed. Um, and I, you know, I still need a, a bit more time to, to wrap my head fully around it. But it's, it's really cool that they're doing the first ever ones um, now and recommend checking it out. Do I have to, to do one more thing? Uh, How yeah. much time is there? Good. Yeah. yeah. All right, so I just want to talk about one other thing in the interest of like financial inclusion. Um, one of the coolest projects I've heard about lately is this, this project called Sovereign. Um, so this is uh, the, the public utility blockchain for identity. And so if you've heard of Civic, 
or U-port, um, there's this, this idea of decentralized identity, and so you have um, you know, situations like ex Experian where these honeypots of data are getting, getting hacked, and um, you know, all of our data is on there, and our social security number is basically useless um, these days, right? Like, it's just everyone's got to go and lock their, their credit scores, and like, it's, the system's a mess. Um, so, you know, there, there is a better future, and it's not just that. You might want to mention Have I Been Phoned, the, the site where you can put in, perhaps, like, there's like Have I Been Phoned.com, you can put your email address in, and it'll tell you, like, what hacks your email address was involved in. Yeah, so Have I Been Phoned. Yeah. That's what it is, yeah. yeah. Um, and someone recently just posted this, like, send your friend this into crypto a, a tulip mem on their phone. So someone's like actually putting a website where you type in your friend's phone number, what crypto he has or she. <laughs> it's like, I was like, wait a minute guys, dude, this is a really bad idea because <laughs> like, so it's possible to socially engineer a phone number port and if you haven't set up all your two-factor authentication, then um, you know, someone and people have had their Coinbase accounts you know, taken over and if even if you have that set up, like if your Google account, um, you need to like actually turn off phone number recovery. It doesn't just just because you're using Google Authenticator for your Google account, it will still offer to uh, do a, a phone number base. So you have to like actually kind of know all these things, and it's not everyone has gone through all that. So if you think it's funny to send your friend that mines crypto a, a tulip and give some random stranger his phone number, you're actually being a really crappy friend. So don't do that. <laughs> Um, but I just want to mention Sovereign quickly and just, just encourage people to check it out. Um, so it's actually under the Hyperledger uh, umbrella. Um, so it's, it's under Hyperledger India is actually the, where the source code has been open sourced. And so they're taking stewardship of like the code, kind of like you know, Bitcoin Core does the Bitcoin code and um, you know, different kinds of open source uh, you know, governance. Um, so Hyperledger, you know, Linux Foundation, uh, I think, you know, a lot of respect for those guys, um, but so they're they've got their test networking now, and it's it's actually a, like an architecture for exchanging identity assertions. So much like you take um, custodianship of your Bitcoin on your own wallet, you can do the same thing with like aspects of your identity. Um, so it really creates a new architecture for the exchange of information about who you are and puts you more back in control of of the data about you and when it's released and how it's released. So it's, it's really important to the to, to the future state, and it's another blockchain. So um, I would encourage you to check it out. And they're they've got a test net running now, so you can check out like their wallets. They have reference wallets on their, their code, and I'm kind of getting like look into how that like kind of the big vision there. Um, Dan's asking to wrap up, but like why I think it's important is because the future di the future digital state of, of crypto is that everyone's gonna have some sort of wallet that's gonna have their money their identity and their contracts. And those three things you should always have complete control of. And you know, the Sovereign Project sort of gives you the same level of control over your identity that Bitcoin and other blockchains give you with your currency. So um, those are uh, kind of my highlights for the last few months. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, so now is a lightning kind of pitch thing. If you have some event or a startup or you're looking for a co-founder, Whatever it is, uh, you're, you get to go out live to the fancy internet where everyone's watching. Uh, so if you want to come up here and make an announcement, doesn't matter what it is, let's do it. Just line up here. Right up here. Anyone? Anyone? Okay, One. All right. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Mike. I'm an organizer with San Francisco Virtual Reality, and we're looking for um, speakers and demos for. Um, it's going to be, the next event is at Microsoft Reactor on January 18th, and we're looking for um, the the theme is brain decoding. So we're looking for people who are talking about neuroscience, artificial intelligence, blockchain, Bitcoin, especially the convergence of science and technology with those those uh, those buzzwords and the technologies behind them. So um, just reach out to me at Micah um, Micah uh, at vrma.io if you want to speak or demo at the event. Thank you. Cool. Anyone else? Want to make an announcement? Yes? All right. Uh, no, it can be better. Hi, my name is Abel Barilo. I am 
a co-instructor at Mission Bit, and Mission Bit is a nonprofit based in the Bay Area, and we are currently looking for volunteers to volunteer at a local high school supporting underrepresented students in coding. Um, you could check out missionbit.org. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, anyone else before we cut it off? All right, so this has been the Crypto Builders Meetup. We should uh, mention Noisebridge one more time for anyone that didn't hear it when we came in. Noisebridge is a nonprofit hacker space um, that has one rule, which is be excellent to each other. We have a bunch of cool equipment. We're open from 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. You're more than welcome to come out here and hack with all the cool stuff that we have. And um, I am Dan Gailey. I'm your organizer for tonight. I'm also the co-founder and CEO of Synapse.ai. We're also running a Decentralized AI Summit coming up in January. You wanna check that out at decentralized-ai.com and we'll see you next time. Be excellent to each other and hack the planet. Cheers.